Well, I think we might uh, I think we might kick off. So, g'day everyone. Welcome, very much welcome to my free webinar today, Living with Mental Illness, How to Think Different, Be Better. Um, I am really pleased to be able to contribute in some way to um, the mental health of people outside of myself, my own family, my own network by doing these webinars. Um, I am not a counsellor, I am not a guru of any sort. I just want to share with you today how I live with my mental illness and how that might help you. Some of the things that I do to try and um, make my life easier might actually help you in, in, in doing yours as well. So um, this webinar should go for about an hour, maybe less if I can squeeze it in um, because I know how uh, important your time is. And so I really just want to get through as much stuff as we can and uh, be able to interact as much as we can with some questions at the end as well. I'm Nick Bowditch, I am a writer, I'm a speaker, and I'm a storyteller. I've written um, a couple of books. The most recent book was um, Reboot Your Thinking, and which has been out for oh, about half a year now, and uh, we've sold a couple of thousand copies, so I'm really stoked, um, and it's available all over the joint now, which is good. Um, I speak for a living, that's my main sort of job, is that I speak at conferences and events. I speak both about marketing, um, and online marketing especially because that's my background and tech startup which is my background as well but I also speak more and more now about um, about mental illness and mental health and especially entrepreneurial mental health which is my kind of specialty and uh, and I am a storyteller I'm a born storyteller I think that we all are actually <laughs> but um, it's something that I do um, a lot and it's something that I help other people tell their story better as well and hopefully um, today that's what we're going to do a bit of today as well. Just a trigger warning at the start. Now I want to read this because this is very really important to me and this is the only slide I read with this many letters on it. Having this many letters on a slide is, is hurting my emotions, don't worry. So let me just get this out. Some of the content today is very raw and very challenging. It could potentially be triggering for you if you have had similar experiences in your life as I've had in mine. If this content brings up something for you that you are not sure how to deal with, Please speak to somebody in your life. And if you don't have anybody to speak to or if you don't feel comfortable speaking to anybody who you know, please call Lifeline on 13 11 14. I'm very proud to be an ambassador for Lifeline and for Lifeline 100 Central Coast. Um, they're doing great work and they save lives and they've saved my life um, before. So please use that number if anything comes up today and you feel like you just need to speak to somebody about it. So we have, a, we have about an hour together and hopefully um, what we'll cover today consists of two main chapters. The first one is I want to just talk about things that hold me back, the things that you know are not positive necessarily in my life, the things that I would love to not have in my life, the things that I would love to respond to better in my life, right? So that's the, sort of the first section, which is kind of the, <laughs> the down and negative side and then the majority of the time today, I'm going to spend um, talking about what propels me forward, what what doesn't hold me back, actually, what is what is a gift to me, and the things that I can harness and appreciate and nurture in my life that are actually really positive things and and drive me forward. So, a quick note: I, I would love you to. I mean, I know this is difficult if you have children in your house. Trust me, I know this. Um, but if you can just remove as many distractions as you can, phones off, um, you know, um, kids sedated. No, I don't mean that. Um, whatever you need to do just to remove as many distractions as you can. So this can really be about you. Um, I would love that. And I'd love it to be that, really, just, just time for yourself. If you are someone like me who is, you know, has, has a pretty hectic sort of home life at least, um, and you know, lots of things going on at once. Often we don't take that time for ourselves that we need, and I would love you to do that today. Also, I'd love you to have a, a, a pen and paper, if you're a pen and paper person, or a memo app open on your phone or whatever today, because there'll be some things that I'd like you to sort of write down and reflect on, and, and you might uh, also um, have something come up that you think, oh shit, I'd like to write that down too. So. Just a quick note to maybe have that near you. Uh, also, just on this note, if you've registered for this webinar and you're actually watching it live, or or if you've if if somebody's registered and they're not watching it live, they'll be sent uh, either way. They'll be sent a replay of it um, tonight. So um, maybe if you don't have a pen and paper handy, you can just watch the video 
later on. So this is my story. I, today is, is, a, is about me. I, I am not, a, as I said, I'm not a guru. I'm not a counselor. I'm not an expert in, in mental health and mental disorders, but I am an expert in my mental health and my mental illnesses. I, I am an absolutely an expert in that. And so I, I don't really deal in shoulds and musts. I don't really tell anyone what they need to do or what they don't need to do with their own headspace. What I do do is just share, maybe too much, <laughs> maybe overshare, um, about my own life and my own stuff. And hopefully just in somebody saying that, you know, speaking their truth about this stuff just makes it resonate with you a little bit and you might just pick things up along the way. But this is not designed in any way for you to go, okay, I've got this stuff going on, I'll watch this and I'll be totally better. That's not what this is about. I, I, I'm not going to tell you you have to do these things, you have to be meditating, you have to whatever. I, I, I just That's just not my style. But this is just really the rawest version of me and my story and, and, and I want to share that today. I should just also point out, um, uh, Mitch, uh, my friend Mitch Dabin is, is helping me out today. Um, what a legend, doing it for, for nothing, having time off his work even to help me. Uh, he's just held, handling the tech of all this today. So if you have any questions, uh, that come up and you either want to use that hashtag reboot 20, 2017 or use the questions portal within the, the webinar platform as you see it now as you're looking at it. Um, Mitch will be able to, he's going to just collate all the questions and at the end um, get, get them to me and we can go through them. But if you have any technical issues yourself right now and you want to just contact um, Mitch and get some help with that, please, um, please let me know in the, or let him know in the questions um, portal. And thanks again Mitch for your time today. What a legend. Okay, so this is, this is basically what we're going to go through today. The, the what holds me back and what propels me forward section. So the things that hold me back is, is, is my unhelpful thinking, um, the things that I think about that aren't helpful, uh, the imposter syndrome, that feeling that I'm a fraud, that I'm, that I'm not enough, that, I, um, you know, that people want me to be something that I'm not or I want to be something that I'm not. And then, and then the six really ugly words. Shame, guilt, anger, fear, pain, and failure. And I'm going to just quickly go through each one of those and, and maybe just diffuse it a little bit into, into changing them into something that holds me back and then be able to propel me forward with it. And then I want to spend the majority of the time talking about the things that really, really help me, the things that are really positive in my life and really propel me forward. And you can see those on the screen there, resilience right through to, to my favorite thing in the world, which is which is kindness. If you if you follow my stuff, you'll know that I bang on about kindness a lot, um, because you know it's free and it's easy and it's wonderful and it's beautiful when someone gives it to you, and it's beautiful when you give it to somebody else. And then I will finish with the secret weapon, the, my secret weapon. In fact, not just one secret weapon, but three. I'm going to give you three secret weapons of how I live differently, like, you know, think differently about each day and, and try to be better each day. Um, how I live with, with my mental uniqueness. And, and the three secret weapons are very simple things that, um, that might help you as well. So this is me. Um, for those people who, who don't know me, I, as you can see, I'm a prolific breeder. Um, I live on the central coast of New South Wales where prolific breeding is something of a sport. Um, but I, um, I am very very blessed to have had these four beautiful gifts given to me and my beautiful partner, Kelly. Um, we have a seven, six, four and a three-year-old. Um, and after last night with a three-year-old being up for about six hours, I don't know if we do that this afternoon, it might be a different picture on the screen. But um, at this stage, we have four children and I am very fortunate to spend a lot of time with them. Through my work, I, I spend a lot of time on the road, but when I'm at home, um, where I am right now, um, I get to spend a lot of time with them. And, and it's, a, it's a joy for me because they're the best therapy and they're also the best trigger for therapy that, um, that I've ever had or known in my life. And I, 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 just, I just love the shit out of them. So this is, this is a slide that I use a lot in the start of my presos because this really is the authentic representation of me. And, um, and, and, you know, I'm very fortunate that my life includes not only these four beautiful things, but um, my beautiful wife, Kelly, as well, who's, who's my greatest support and um, my greatest cheerleader as well. 
I have in the past worked at Facebook. Uh, I was the manager of small business operations for Facebook for Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I worked within the Asia Pacific um, team for Facebook for uh, almost three years. After that, then I worked for about a year at Twitter. Um, so I come today as um, someone who has worked for those two big brands and I've seen a lot of entrepreneurial mental health, both issues as well as great overcomes in, 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 in those two platforms and being able to work in that tech world for so long. Um, now as a speaker and consultant, I work with a lot of different big brands and you can see some of the brands there that I've worked with being Uber and Google and Fairfax and News Corp and Qantas and um, the two banks, Combank and Bankwest. And this is also me. I am an addict. I have uh, depression and sometimes that depression is so bad and so marked that I can't get out of bed in the morning. I can't function properly each day. Um, Sometimes I don't want to get out of bed. Sometimes I'd love to get out of bed and just can't. Um, but I think that each time I think about my depression, I, I do think about it being something that is inherently in me. I don't, I don't shirk it. I don't dodge it. I think that it's something that makes me who I am, actually. Um, along with the depression, I also have post-traumatic stress from... Um, three years of sexual trauma that I had as a, as a child um, to someone who wasn't part of my family but was known to me and, and took advantage of um, my innocence at that time. Um, because of that traumatic experience, I now have PTSD, which um, I take medication for every day. And if I don't, then I have nightmares every single night from that um, harrowing, brutal nightmares and so I understand what it's like to live with something every single day and I understand what it's like to have to medicate something to live with something every single day um, I wish that wasn't true I really do but it's but it's but it is true and I'm probably gonna have to take that medication for the rest of my life and and I am totally resolved to that because it means that I'm able to focus and um, you know, have purpose and function properly and be a dad properly and be a husband properly, whereas I haven't been before, which is why I have developed addictions um, over the years and why I'm in recovery from addictions right now. So you might kind of wonder, how do, how do those two people, you know, someone who, who has had success in their own tech startups and built and sold startups of their own, worked in places like Facebook and Twitter and, and consulted to Google and Uber and Qantas, how does that, both of those people live in the one head, you know, we live in one brain and that's what I'm going to talk about today. How I basically live with all of this stuff going on and still, you know, still be, be more, more or less presentable depending on your point of view um, and function, you know, effectively. Recently I have just finished um, my book, uh, Reboot Your Thinking, as I mentioned before. Um, it's a 28 day guide really of how I, how I'm mindful of a different theme each day for four weeks and that's a running thing with me and some of those themes we'll talk about today. Um, I'm really stoked that the, that the book is available in so many places now and um, you know, so you know, every bookstore in Australia and New Zealand and, and any bookstore around the world now can actually order it in if they, don't, if they don't carry it right now and you can buy it online at all these different brands as well. One last thing, uh, again, I would love to use the hashtag Reboot2017 if you uh, want to make any comments or anything. And I, if I miss your question today, I would I'll, uh, please use that hashtag and I'll get back to you. I'm going to watch that hashtag all day today and be able to get back to people. And, and, uh, and I'm really appreciative of any sort of interaction through it. So here's my problem. My problem is that the world is not like me. The, the problem is everybody else is normal. The problem is... I'm special and, and nobody understands me. And the problem is my stuff is more important than anybody else's. And all of that stuff is bullshit. But that problem is the stuff that I tell myself to make it okay. And it's, and it's a running theme with me that, you know, I create problems out of nothing. My problems are all in the past, in what I remember, and they're all in the future. My, my, my problems do not exist in the present moment and that's what I have to focus on. In this moment right now, 
I haven't used any drugs. I haven't lied any, to anyone. I haven't hurt anyone. I haven't stolen anything. I haven't cheated. I haven't done any of those things. In each <clears throat> present moment, I am safe. But if I think about the past or if I think about the future, my goodness, that's where I start to get you know, into a big hole. And both of those things actually don't actually exist, right? The future certainly doesn't exist yet. If the stuff that I'm worried about in the future, it hasn't happened yet, and it probably won't. And the stuff in the, in the past is only my memory. It's only a construct of what happened in the past. It's not really real either. So I've just got to focus on what's real, and that's the present moment. Right? So that's my biggest problem. My biggest problem is I feel like the world owes me something because of what happened to me. I feel like nobody gets me because everybody else is normal and I'm not. And that's just flat out not true. Right? So that's the problem. The solution, though, is a simple one. And the solution one is, is something that I've found in the last sort of 12 months, actually. Um, now, I should say, it doesn't fix me. I'm not fixed. I am absolutely not fixed. And I'm a long way from fixed, and I probably won't ever be fixed. But, but the solution is pretty simple to, to actually getting me on the road to feeling better and, and thinking different and being better. And that is, this, that was when I realized that my mental illness is actually a gift to me. It's my superpower, right? The things that, that other people would think of and, and what I would normally have thought of as a, something that, that you know, is a defect of my character, I don't think that anymore. I try to reframe it as much as I can because I know what it's like to live with constant pain, right? emotional pain. I know what it's like to live with addiction. I know what it's like to live with these thoughts and, and sometimes the thoughts that tell you that you've got to stop living You've got to stop being part of this world. You've got to stop dragging everyone down. I know what it's like to live with that dark, horrible thought. And if I don't use that and reframe it into being something that actually makes me superhuman, that makes me a superpower, you know, because I feel that stuff, you know, people who don't have the mental illness experience, the mental health experience I have, they don't have that realization. They don't have that stuff they don't know what they're made of they don't know what they're really capable of you know and so i think of that as as absolutely a gift to me um and it's something that makes me you know I, t I talk less about mental health and mental illness and I talk more about mental uniqueness my mental uniqueness is is the, how my think how i think differently my thoughts aren't broken they're just different thoughts you know and 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 i think the more i think about that the more it poses to me or presents to me a solution to to the depression, to the anxiety, and to the PTSD, and to the addiction, and all the other crazy shit that's going on in my head. So let's spend a couple of minutes talking about what holds me back then. The first thing and the most obvious thing to me is that my core beliefs lie to me. The things that I think are true are not, they're just not true. And, and I think this might be the case for a lot of people. And, and so, you know, if I think about these sort of common beliefs that, or misbeliefs that people have about themselves, you know, I think some of us think about these, have thought about at least one of these things um, pretty regularly for a long time, you know. Uh, some of them are really hard to even read, far less say out loud or feel. But these are the things that we think about, that I think about, which aren't true. They're not true. And these two are my particular favorites. <laughs> these two are the ones that come up over and over and over again for me and have caused me in the past to, to find substances and processes uh, to become addicted to so as to not feel this stuff, to numb this stuff, you know, to make me feel like I am worthy and I am lovable, or to convince people in my life that I am actually unworthy and unlovable. I'm unworthy of them. I'm unworthy of the good stuff in my life. And so I, I used to act out and do stupid shit and hurt people so that they would see that and go, Jesus, you, you're a jerk. And I'd go, yeah, I know. See, I told you, right? That's, a, that's fulfilled that prophecy for me, which, which is craziness, that core belief that I lied to myself and that I lie to myself about all the time. And it's just not true, right? It's just not true. So I want to challenge you to think about this for a couple of minutes here. I want, to think, I want you to think about what your core beliefs are. And I'm just going to put this list back up for a moment. And that doesn't mean you have to choose one of these. These are just, you know, some of my favorites. <laughs> but 
but they might be something else that you think about. And I just want you to jot it down. Just be mindful. I'm just going to stop talking for 30 seconds. Just be mindful of the lies that you tell yourself. What do you think some of those might be? And I'll be back in 30 seconds. Okay, that gives me a chance to uh, just have a quick swig of drink as well. Um, okay, so I, I hope that you've got something down. I really hope that you've got nothing down. I really hope that you are looking at a blank piece of paper right now. That would make me so happy. But let's move on. So what other unhelpful thinking styles do I have? What other things that I think about myself which not only aren't fucking true, but they aren't really helpful and aren't helping me in my day either. And this is styles of thinking as opposed to actual things that I think. So, you know, the, the black and white thinking is big for me. You're with me or you're against me. You know, you know it or you don't. You're a jerk or you're a good guy. Like this sort of thinking is not helpful. Minimizing and maximizing. Jesus, the maximizing thing I do a lot and the minimizing my own behavior I do a lot. I overgeneralize a lot, you know. Everyone else is normal. I am fucked. This is not true, right? But this is the overgeneralization that I do. Emotional reasoning, personalization, catastrophizing is massive for me. I can go from a seemingly nothing or a very small thing in my life, like some, I've rung somebody on the phone and they didn't answer. And in the next five minutes, I have progressed through, they didn't answer because they think I'm a dick. And now they're, they're talking to somebody else because they don't want to work with me anymore. And they don't want to be my friend anymore. And now they're, you know, they're chatting up my wife because they're not talking to me. That's what they're doing. They're talking to Kelly. And now um, Kelly's going to leave me because she's going to go off this person that didn't answer their phone four minutes ago. That, that is just rubbish, right? But that's what I do. This, this snowball down the mountain thing is, is what I can do if I, if I let those thoughts sort of go, right? Shoulds and musts are another big thing which I try and avoid all the time, you know. I, I really don't like it when people say, you must do this or you should do this. And that's not just because I don't like rules, because I don't like rules. But, you know, I just feel like, especially in terms of somebody's mental uniqueness, like nobody knows really what's going on for me, really. You know, don't, don't tell me how I should fix it. Don't tell me about your new MLM product that's a multivitamin that's going to cure me of my... PTSD like I don't, like just don't tell me something I must do or something I should do it drives me crazy right jumping to conclusions I do labeling everything as I do and of course blaming the past is something that's very big for me too but this is the king this is the king of my unhelpful thinking style is that I don't think anybody is my peer I don't think anybody is even to me everybody in my life whether I know them or I've just met them, I quickly race to put them into one of two buckets. They are better than me or they are less than me. And sometimes I'm more of a less than guy and sometimes I'm more of a better than guy, but you know, it, it can be either way and it can be either way within 30 seconds. But I, I always, always think of myself as either better than or less than somebody else. And the problem with that is A, it's not true and B, I'm attaching value to not only myself, but to them that I don't, I can't really accurately have as a metric. I, I don't know if they're, I don't know what's going on for them, right? And they don't know what's going on for me. The thing that I have learned more than anything else in, in, in when I started to talk more about mental uniqueness and, and, and start to talk more about mental health stuff is that everybody's got something going on, right? Or everybody at least knows somebody who's got something going on. And if you're watching this, then that's you, baby, right? You, every, every one of us has something. So, you know, I can think somebody is better than me and, and what I go on about then is, oh, they're, they're healthier than me, they're smarter than me, they're not as, um, you know, they're not, they're not as pressed as I am, they're not as challenged as I am, they've got everything so easy, excuse me, and, and it's not true, you know? I, I find out later that they've had all these similar struggles, that they've got an alcohol addiction, that they've got whatever. So. This is a really unhelpful thinking style and something that I would really, really like to stop. 
Just a quick, a quick reminder at this point too, if you have any questions um, for Mitch or for me, um, or for, for me and that Mitch can collate, please add it in the questions portal as we go along and, and there'll be a question section at the end that I hopefully to get through as many as I can. The imposter syndrome is very, very big in me. The imposter syndrome is the thing that says, before I get up and do a, a presentation in front of 500 people in a room at some conference, that moment before I go on the stage, the little voice in my head that says, today is the day. Today is the day that those 500 people work out that you are a bullshit artist, that you don't know what you're talking about at all, that you are just as broken, if not more broken than anybody else, that you shouldn't even be talking about this stuff because you're not even an expert, that you don't have a degree in psychology and you're not a counsellor, so why are you doing this stuff? All that stuff creeps in very, very, very quickly and it's super debilitating because it's very loud and very real. And, and so I, I've got sort of five things that I do to try and, try and quiet that noise, right? Try and stop that imposter syndrome being something in my life so presently, right? And the first thing is that I just, I don't try to be perfect. I just try to be valuable. I just try and add value. The minute I try and be perfect, is the minute I'm going to be that imposter, right? And that imposter syndrome is going to be fed ink and right on spot on accurate because I won't be being myself. I'll just be trying to be a perfect version of me, which I've never met yet and I probably won't. Um, you know, so I just try and add value. Second thing is I just try and stop comparing myself to everyone else, which is really hard to do. But if I can do that, then I'm going to just relieve a little bit of the pressure that says that I'm the imposter because I'm not even comparing myself to anyone you know like I can I can get into a frame of mind where I'm comparing myself to some of the best speakers in in the world about mental health and and about vulnerability and about different things and I just think god I'm not them you know I don't have done I haven't done this world tour I haven't written 20 books you know and so I, I've just stopped to stop got to, got to stop comparing myself the third thing I've got to try and do is try not to take myself so bloody seriously you know, I can take myself very, very seriously and think that, you know, the stuff that I'm doing is is more important than anything else anybody else is doing. And the stuff that I'm doing is so world breaking and, and great that it's never I've never done anything as great as it and blah, blah, blah. You know, I take myself very seriously and sometimes I just have to look at myself and say, you know what, <laughs> you're pretty fortunate that you're doing what you're doing right now and you should probably just be happy with that. Like just be just be calm tiger so that's the third thing the fourth thing is and this might sound a bit narcissistic or a bit a bit of a wanker but I, I keep a nice file I keep a file of things that people have said to me which were nice and I keep that on my Google Drive and it might just be comments on my Facebook page or after an, an event or after a speaking gig or feedback from a book or something you know a sentence it can be a sentence or it can be a blog post it can be different things but but I keep all of that stuff and when I when I feel a bit bit yuck and a bit down and a bit bit of that imposter syndrome coming in I just look at those things and I see them as unsolicited kindness that that I didn't ask for and so I you know so it's real it's genuine and authentic and and that's just a really good way for me to ground myself in the fact that you know not only do I not have to take myself too seriously but I'm doing okay and then the fifth thing I think and I think I think this is pretty handy for everyone is I just have a crack anyway because I don't reckon anybody knows what they're doing you know, I just, uh, I think, I think this is as much a thing as, as anything as people just compare themselves to other people and, and, and have this imposter syndrome because they, they don't know what's going on for anybody else, you know, and they think that everybody else is better than them and stuff. And I just think, fuck that. I'm just going to have a crack and see how I go. I'm just going to put on a webinar and talk about um, living with mental illness and see who comes and 128 people register and a lot more people will watch the video. You know, what's, what's the harm in that? That's if I wouldn't have that crack, I wouldn't be able to have, this platform. So I want to then talk about the in this things that hold me back. Last thing I want to talk about is is the gifts that are wrapped in shit. So these six things all have gifts hidden in them, little Easter eggs hidden in them. But but you have to get through the hard stuff to get to it. And the first is shame. My God, that even that word is awful to look at, right? And shame holds me back hundred percent. My life is coloured and darkened by shame, and it's it's toxic shame and it's carried shame. It's not mine. You know, it's the shame of being um, a sexual assault victim 
or somebody who was the victim of sexual assault for, for a few years and the shame that comes around that, and that's not even mine. You know, that's his. That's the person who perpetrated the abuse on me. That's not mine. But I've carried it so dear and so close to me for so long that it's actually represented itself in PTSD, in depression, in anxiety, in addiction, in anything that I can numb that shame with. And, and so I know what it's like to live in the vulnerable, horrible space of being shamed and feeling shame every day in your life. But this is an important thing that I think about. Shame is only how other people see us. It's how we see ourselves through other people's eyes right? It's not how, how we can feel about ourselves if we're really mindful of it. It's not how we can convince people um, that we are different, that we are something else. It's just how we see ourselves when we imagine how other people see us. And that is the simplest thing to cut through it. That, you know, it's not about how we are seen by Joe Blow. The world is about how we are seen by us seen by ourselves and how we are seen by those people in our network who love us and, and deal with us every day, live with us every day. There's two sorts of shame that are, you know, healthy shame is when I'm walking up on a stage in front of 500 people and I trip up the step or I do the first four minutes of the prezzo with my fly undone or whatever. That stuff is just healthy shame. You'll get over that right that's not gonna that's not gonna lead you to the top of a tall building it's 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 embarrassing and you wish it didn't happen but it's you'll you'll be okay there's toxic shame which is the other stuff the stuff that's really hurtful the stuff that's really hard to escape and and not not live with and and that's the stuff that is not great and i think the biggest thing that i think about to try and cut through and be better through this stuff is i just try to think about whose shame is it that i'm carrying is it my shame or is it the perpetrator of the abuse? Is it somebody who has wronged me in the past? Is it somebody who has convinced me that I'm less than? Like that stuff isn't my shame. That stuff is somebody else's. That's somebody, that's somebody else's stuff. And I don't, I don't want to carry that anymore. And guilt as well is, is another thing that, that you know, has some gifts wrapped in it too. Guilt is, is kind of a lot is placed in the same bucket as shame, but it's very different. And I, th I love this quote that you should never agree anything because at one time it was what you wanted. You know, we feel guilty about what we've done, what we've said, what we've eaten, what we've drank, what we've taken, what we've done, whatever. But at one time that was what you wanted, you know, and I think that's a nice way to nullify that guilt a little bit. And then I, there's a big, big difference between guilt and shame. And this is it. The guilt that says I did something bad, but the shame, the bad stuff says I am bad. One thing you can get past really easily, the guilt you can get past easily, in, at least in the moment, but the shame is everlasting and it's toxic and it's debilitating and it's shit. And it often leads to anger, right? Anger's the third, the third thing that holds me back a little bit. But, and anger, it's funny, anger is something that we are constantly told not to feel. You know, we tell our kids, don't be angry or, you know, calm down or whatever, or, or if we're telling someone something, we say, hey, 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 and they start to blow up, you say, hey, hey, don't be angry. Like, you know, it's, it's just crazy to me that we just don't want to ever feel it because it's ugly and uncomfortable, but it's just anger. It's just a thing. It's just an emotion, a feeling. It's like anything else. It isn't good or bad. It just is, you know? So I feel like that's a nice way to nullify that one too, you know, a little bit and, and be able to cut through what's, what's bad about it, you know? And, and, and the anger that leads to the fear then is, is the thing that's difficult too. And I, that's, this is where curiosity comes in. I love curiosity. I think that it's going to, and I, as James Stevens quote here is, curiosity will conquer fear more than bravery ever will. I don't think the opposite of bravery is courage. I think the opposite of bravery, uh, sorry, I don't think the opposite of fear is courage. I think the opposite of fear is curiosity is wanting to know more about yourself, is wanting to feel like you are more in control of your fear. Because fear is the other thing we tell people not to feel all the time, especially our kids. I say it to my kids all the time, like, what are you afraid of that for? You know, that, that's not scary. Or, you know, they say, they come into my bed at night because they've had a bad dream. And I, and I say to them, well, it's not real. Like, just go to sleep. 
You know, like instead of thinking, well, shit, something's happened here and you've been traumatized by it at least a little bit. You're fearful of it. Let's talk about that, right? Pain. Oh, geez, pain is pain, right? Pain is hard and it's pain is hard to live with, but it doesn't have to be ever present. It doesn't have to lead to other things. It doesn't have to drag us down. Um, but pain is real and, and, it's, and it is hard to live with, no doubt, as is the sense of failure. You know, these are the six things that I, that I think are very difficult for me to live with sometimes because I deal with them poorly, right? I treat them poorly. I don't recognize them poorly. I don't feel them properly. And they're the things that, that lead me kind of under. So this is how, what I mean by gifts wrapped in shit. If those six things that are terrible things, even looking at the words now, I still think, oh, God, they're terrible, especially that first one, shame. But the things, the second column here is what shame does to us, right? What shame brings to us. But the gift that is wrapped in all of that ugliness are in the last column. From shame, you feel human. You feel humble. That's a gift, that if you did, weren't given the shame in the first place, you wouldn't feel. Out of guilt comes this, the sense of having values and of making amends to people, right? That strengthens your f- personal philosophy and your personal brand. That makes you a better person. Anger gives you strength, you know, and assertiveness. And you wouldn't have that if you were never allowed to get angry, right? If you're never allowed to get fearful or afraid, then you never learn the gift or never ha- get the Get given the gift of protection and wisdom, you know, and if you never feel pain, you never feel healing. And God, that's the worst one of all, right? If you never feel like you're healing, you've never actually felt or dealt with that pain properly before. And then the, and then the big one, the last one really is, is resilience for me. Resilience is, is born of failure. If you, if, you don't, if you don't fail, you can't be resilient. And that's a shame because I think when we're resilient, we're, we're really good. You know, that's, that's when we're our best when we can bounce back and when we can take stuff on and, and rebound accordingly. So then let's spend some time on the positive stuff. What, what propels us forward? What makes me better? And the first one is that resilience. I'm better because I can deal with the stuff that I, that I have to deal with. I can live with the stuff that I have to live with. I, it, isn't, it isn't the end for me. Nothing is going to stop me unless I stop being resilient, resilient from the stuff that's happened before. This is one of my favorite quotes and one of my favorite affirmations that I use every day. This is something I literally, as goofy as it sounds, I literally stand in front of a mirror every day and say these words, sometimes out loud if no one's around, but otherwise i just just mindful of them, that I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Carl Jung, who's, who's a great, great teacher of mine, he was a student of um, Sigmund Freud until they had a falling out. They had slightly different ideas around psychotherapy, but... He's a really clever guy and he's a really insightful person about this sort of stuff, about trauma and resilience from trauma. And I am absolutely not what happened to me, right? I, I, but I do have the choice every day to be that or I have the choice to rebound and be resilient and move on from that. Gratitude is big in my life. It never was. Until the last year, I was never grateful for anything. I was never thankful for anything. But the thing about being grateful or having gratitude is if you don't write it down, if you don't say it out loud, it is lessened, you know. And, and I'm not – look, I know it's really woo-woo to, woo-woo to talk about making a gratitude list and stuff, but it fucking works. When you write down the things or if you, when you, even if you don't write it down, even you're just really mindful of the things you're grateful for, you are actually more grateful for them. And gratitude is, is something that propels me forward big style, as does criticism. So this might seem a bit weird, but the, the, when, when I think about criticism, it is actually some, it's a gift to me. Feedback is a gift, even if it's criticism, even if it's really negative criticism, it's still somebody's truth that they're telling you. And I feel like we can, if we, if we don't just discount it or defend it and get crazy about it, and get angry about it in a way that you can't harness that anger properly, that's when criticism is negative. But I, I, love, I love receiving criticism now where I never used to because I was so precious. But having said that, this is a quote of mine which I, which I, which I say a lot, you know, is that other people will try and bring you down because you are trying something new or you are, you are trying to be a better version of yourself or you are whatever. And I just don't think you should ever listen to anyone who is covering up their own fear because they won't have a crack by attacking you for having a crack. They don't get that say. If somebody is sitting in there 
dark bedroom being a keyboard warrior on my Facebook post or on my videos and saying that I'm the dick and I'm this and that. Do I care about those people? No. Do I care about their opinion? No. Because they're not in the arena with me, as Brene Brown would say. They are not having a go. If they are, then I'm more like, more than happy to take criticism and take feedback. But no, nah. if someone is, is only covering up their fear by attacking you for addressing your curiosity, they don't get a say. They don't get to critique you or me. Fun is something that definitely propels me forward. And, and as an addict and in my height of all that going on for me, there was very little fun. There was very little fun in my life and I was a source of very little fun in my kids and my partners and my family's life and my friend's life. But when you can find that fun, wow, it's great. Like it is the simplest gift that nature ever gave us. It was the fact that we are organisms that can have fun. And there's not very many, you know, that, that you know, dogs and dolphins outside. I, I'm not really a cat person. They don't seem to ever have fun. But, you know, maybe I could be wrong there. But, um, you know, fun is something that is a great, great power, a superpower too for humans. As is mindfulness, you know, I, I, and I don't, I, I'm not, I, I practice mindfulness every day or I meditate every day, but I don't do it for 30 minutes with my legs crossed sitting in under a, a you know, Brahma triangle or anything like that. I, I, I'm just more like right now, right in this moment, I can see these things in front of me. I can feel the air conditioning on my neck. I can feel my feet on the floor. I know that I am safe. This mind, being mindful of this present moment is keeping me grounded and aligned with my values and aligned with what I want to do today and what I don't want to do today. Where as soon as I start to lose track of that, I've lost track of my recovery, right? And that's when the PTSD builds and that's when the depression can keep me in bed for a week. And that's when all these other things can happen. So I just practice mindfulness in, in that I try to be as aware of the present moment as I possibly can in each present moment. I try to be as authentic as I can. You know, I, I, I feel like I do a pretty good job of this where I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not a suit and tie guy. So you'll never see me in one, even if I'm presenting at a big, a massive big televised conference, which I've done with multiple thousands of people. And I'm still going to do it in jeans and my, my pluggers and, and a t-shirt because that's me. You know, if I, if I try to be something that I'm not, that's, then I'm lying. I'm lying to whoever I'm trying to be inauthentic to. And lying is the first thing that drives me back down to the addiction rate. So I have to avoid that at all costs. And uh, authenticity helps me avoid that. As does just being open, you know, and I know, I know that some people feel like I'm a little bit too open about stuff and that I overshare and that's all right. You know, maybe that's their own stuff a little bit too. But um, when I'm open and transparent and honest, I do not go down the road of addiction as much. I don't go down the road of self-absorption as much. And I don't go down the road of being depressed and angry and anxious as much either. That openness can save me. As can boldness. I think boldness is the sexiest trait a human being can have. To be able to say, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. This is who I am. You know, this is what I feel. Don't tell me what I feel because I'm telling you what I feel. You know, that boldness is a, a fantastic, wonderful thing that, that you know, is so often um, held down by meekness or by somebody saying, don't be so brash or don't be so yourself, you know, try to be a bit, bit quieter or try to be a bit more modest or whatever. That's the worst thing I could ever tell anyone, I reckon, or ever be told. We've got a few minutes left, so I just want to remind you that if you have any questions, please put them in the question box and, uh, and Mitch will let me know what they are um, so we can do some quick Q&A in the end as well. Uh, happiness as well is a big one for me. Happiness is, is uh, something that I strive for, really. You know, like when, it, when I'm happy, it means that the stuff that could hold me back is not. The stuff that I could get dwelling on in the past or the future, I'm not. Because while I am, I'm certainly not happy, right? So... The, 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 the ability to be happy is, is a great gift of my mental uniqueness, but it's also one of the first things that goes, and it's also the metric of how I know when things are going a bit shit is when I just don't feel happy or I can't see happiness or find happiness and joy in the things that should bring me joy, right, in my family and my kids and my work and my partner and, and whatever. That's the first sign. So happiness is something that definitely propels me forward because I love to, I love to feel it.
because I didn't feel it for a very, very long time. And my tribe is important to me too. You know, there's not many people in it actually. When I really think about the people who are really in my tribe, the people who I really think would, would, would take feedback from or listen to or, or you know, defend or drag out of a burning building, those people in my life are really, really important to me. And I would suggest that whoever they are in your life, they're really, really important to you too. They're the ones that put up with our shit. They're the ones who sometimes enable our shit too. But, you know, they're the ones who are going to save us, who are going to be something and someone to live for. And I think once you find them, it's a great, great thing. Imperfection as opposed to perfection is what drives me forward too. You know, in all of my madness, thank God, perfectionism isn't one of the things that, that is up there because if it was, I would be a complete nightmare and really, really hard work, harder work to live with. Um, I, I, as I said to you before, I don't try to be perfect. I just try to be valuable. Perfection is the silliest thing in the world to strive for or to, to have as something in our makeup because we will never, ever get it. And the second thing is, if you're a perfectionist, it's not just you, you're hurting. You know, if I was a perfectionist, I would be shitting to tears everyone around me because I would want the same for them. I would want them to be just as perfect. And it's, it's just not fair. You know, it's not, it's not true. So, so that's, that's the imperfection. And then the last thing that propels me forward is, is really is kindness. You know, kindness is the greatest gift that not only you can ever be given, but you can never give. And it's something that we don't give enough. You know, in a business sense, I talk a lot about how kindness will never, um, you'll never lose business by being kind. You'll only ever gain it. You know, no one's ever going to say, oh, Jesus, that's so kind. I can't stand it. Right. So I, I just think it's something that we don't use enough. And we, and it's, which is actually a value because the reason it's so powerful and so wonderful is that it's so rare. But, um, but it's, it saves me and it definitely brings me forward. When someone is kind to me as well as when I'm able to spend some kindness on somebody else or myself, then it absolutely is something that drives me forward. So here it is. Here's the secret weapons, right? The, the secret weapons that are going to, that not only are going to, but do help me move forward. The first thing is I just try to focus on fact, not the, the rubbish story that I've been told or that I tell myself in my head, not, um, you know, the stuff that other people tell me, which is covering their own fear for attacking me for having a crack. None of that. I just focus on what is real, right? And there's a lot of, there's been a lot of talk in the last week about alternative facts, but that's not real either, right? I just focus on what is fact. The second thing then is I ask myself this a lot, and it's a wonderful question to ask you because it's super challenging of yourself, is what would I do if I wasn't afraid? I really love the notion of, of trying, of seeing something that is, makes you really fearful but doing it anyway. You know, doing something every day, every week, every month, every year that scares the shit out of you. I love that. You know, and I feel like if I wasn't afraid, I would do all sorts of things differently. And that's the stuff that I like to focus on because it's one of the secret weapons for me. And then the third thing is, as I said before, is I just try to commit to the present. What's going on right now? What is real right now? Not what I think was real in the past or what I'm sure will be real in the future, but what is actually happening right now. And they're the secret weapons for me, the three things that absolutely help me think different and be better, be the better version of myself. So that's, that's, that's kind of the, the presentation in a nutshell. That's, these are the things. And again, I, I can share this deck with anybody who wants it afterwards. And, and you can watch the video again if, if, you, if you like uh, as well. Give me some feedback. Um, I would love some feedback. Feedback's a gift for me. And, and you know, I, I mentioned that I thrive on criticism. So you please use the hashtag reboot2017 or put your questions in now. The questions are coming in now. I can see um, Mitch is sending them to me. So we'll go through those in a minute. But I really want to thank you for your attention today and for just for being here and taking a punt on giving me an hour of your life on to talk about hard stuff um, because I know it's not as simple as it seems. So, yeah, thank you for that. So let's get to some questions then. Um, the first question we have is, and please keep them coming in now if you've got any, put them up there or, or on the hashtag because um, Mitch can let me know. The first question is from Jane. 
And she says, how do we cope with others' misunderstanding or, or inability to cope with mental or, or emotional distress? And, and I'm not sure here, Jane, whether, whether, you, whether you're talking about your mental illness or, or their own and you look on and you're trying to convince them of theirs. So I'll take it two ways. The first thing is if it's their mental illness and you're trying to, to convince them, you know, I, I, I met a lady the other day who, who was talking about how she really wants to get her son into the rehab that I went to um, in Sydney. And she, but she said, you know, he just won't. He won't listen. He just won't accept that he has this problem. And, and I really need him to go in there. I need to get him into rehab. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That is, that is not your need. That is his, right? And, and I, I feel like this is a very strong sort of undercurrent of codependency is when somebody says, I really need them to fix themselves. I really need them to be happy. I need them to be better. You know, and so my advice to her was forget him. Get yourself right. You know, like work on yourself. If, if, because if you put someone into rehab, literally put them into rehab, that's not going to work. It's just not going to work. You know, they have to be motivated or accepting and resolving of the fact, uh, resolute of the fact that they need to get fixed. In the meantime, work on your own stuff. You know, be happy for yourself. Build your own brand. Make, make the best version of yourself because when they get that help that they need, whether they need it real or if it's just your perception of it or not, you'll be ready for them. You'll be ready and be the best version of you, and, and that's all that we can ask, right, is, is just to look on our own stuff. Now, if the second part of or the, the alternative view of Jane's question is how do we cope with others misunderstanding our own mental illness, again, same answer. We don't. Like, I, I don't. I can only answer for myself, as I said at the start. If somebody doesn't get me, if somebody says PTSD isn't real to me, or if someone says, just get out of bed, just be happy, you know, I hear that all the time. And if you have depression or anxiety and you're in this group, you've heard it too, where someone says, just calm down. Just go for a walk. Like, just be happy. Like, what's... And I think, Jesus, man, if I could do that, we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? So I just think you've got to work on your own stuff. You've just got to look after yourself and you've got to make it about yourself and be the best version of yourself you can be. Um, I hope that answers your question, Jane, because I'm, I'm not sure how... how... Uh, your question was met. A um, uh, question coming in from Dave Oliver. G'day, Dave, who's, who has a little uh, venture called Recovery Now, which is about to start a, a big national tour helping people like Dave and I who struggle with addiction or have struggled with addiction. His question is, I'm struggling um, with navigating the recovery process, mainly family and friends asking, why are you going to meetings, seeing professionals, etc.? I'm clean, happy and functioning, getting my life together finding all the external advice quite distracting. Any advice on what is important here? Again, Dave, I would go back to the question, the answer I had for Jane. If you're going to meetings, if you're going to fellowship meetings, if you're going to therapy and whatever, who gives a shit what anybody else thinks of that? That's for you. You're doing that because you want to be the best version of you, Dave, as I want to be the best version of me. And I, 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 I get that it's distracting, but again, if it's coming from somebody who is not having a crack themselves, if they're not dealing with their own stuff, that they almost certainly have, then they are, they don't get to critique me, and that's that's as simple as advice I can give you. I don't know if that's too simple, but um, question from Fiona: um, What was the turning point for you? Was there a single aha moment? Um, this is hard. Okay, um, the turning point for me was really where my life fell apart, my marriage fell apart, um, and I started to put my addiction and my mental illness stuff ahead of what would absolutely have brought me joy and recovery. And that was my, my wife and my children. I isolated and disconnect from everybody. And there was the point where I went to rehab actually. And the biggest turning point I've ever had in my life was the very first day I sat in rehab and there was a lecture on that day and it was about reparenting yourself and the therapist got up and the first thing she said was, you have to, to the group of us, you have to understand something. You have to understand that nobody else is coming. There's no cavalry riding over the hill. There's, your parents aren't coming back to, to help you where they could have before. Your family aren't going to suddenly understand you. Nobody else is coming. It has to be you. And that was, and I just, when, when she said that, 
I just cried and cried and cried because that was the moment where I knew that I had done these things to myself. Like I, hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't abused myself as a kid. I didn't do those things. But I had not done anything about putting myself in a, in a place where I was recovering. I had continued to use and continued to hurt people and continue to do all these things. And, and it, just, it just wasn't helpful, you know, and I didn't help myself. And, that, and I have to think about that every day. Actually, I, I try to think and be mindful of that every day, that nobody else is coming. And if you're not going to do it, if I'm not going to do it for myself, nobody else is. So that was my turning point. Um, uh, sorry, just to follow up from Dave, uh, they're asking why he isn't going to those meetings, why you aren't seeing professionals. Oh, sorry, sorry, Matt. Again, who cares? You're doing what you're doing. Like the stuff that you're doing with recovery now, and I suggest everybody have a look at it. It's really good, actually. Some video content, uh, very authentic and, and stuff, just like my stuff, hopefully. Um, but again, that stuff is service, Dave. That stuff is you helping yourself be better, right? And, 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 and I would question if the people who are saying, why aren't you in therapy, to any of us, why aren't you doing therapy? And if they're not doing therapy, I would say, but the fuck out. Who cares? You know, your, your opinion doesn't count to me. You don't know what's going on for me. And even if, even if, even if you, they are doing therapy and you don't want to, that's up to you too. I would stress again that nobody else is coming. It's your therapy. It's your recovery. Right? Nobody else's. So do it your own way. But also take the, take the hit that if you're not doing enough, you have to accept that too. You have to, you know, it's all very well to blame people for what's going wrong, but you, you, you can also blame people for what's going right. And, and I think sometimes we, we lose track of that. That's, that's, you know, difficult, but that's the way it is. So if there's any more, we'll leave it there, but there's any, I know there's some more questions, but we won't get to them right now. So I'll, I'll try to get back to you, um, you know, soon, uh, either on the hashtag or, or by email or on Facebook or whatever for those. Um, so just very quickly wrapping up, this is my website, as you would have come to to register, um, at nickbowditch.com. Um, one of the pages on there is my speaking page, which, which you'll, if you're someone who books um, speakers or on events or if you know somebody um, and you would love to share that, I would love you to share that. I, that would be a great thing for me. So I really appreciate it if you would. Um, and again, that's just nickbowditch.com.au slash speaking. Um, this is how you get hold of me. After today, I am at Nick Bowditch on everything now, which is cool. And uh, my website, as I said, is, is nickbowditch.com, uh, Facebook, Insta, Snapchat, and Twitter. And this is my book, uh, Reboot You're Thinking. Uh, it's available now through all these different online places as well as um, every bookshop can order it. And if they don't have it, Dimmix in it, that's in every Dimmix now, which is great. Also Bookface, which has five or six branches all around um, the East Coast of New South Wales. It's in there as well. Or if you go to reboot28.co slash buy, you can find the book there as well um, to buy it online. So I want to finish with this. Focus on fact. What would I do if I wasn't afraid? Commit to the present. They're my three single, uh, three secret weapons to helping me think differently and be better each day. And, and I think as soon as I lose track of those things, that's where I start to get a bit awry. And it might work for you too. Again, I'm not a shoulds and must man. This is just what works for me. So let's keep the conversation going now. Use the hashtag Reboot2017 if you have anything to add or questions or feedback or conversation between you guys who are listening. I'd, I'd love that um, to happen. If I, if I can be the spark that starts that, then I'd be stoked. So thank you very much for that and, and use that hashtag if you want to get back to me. And thank you very much. I, I, I can't thank you guys enough for checking in and, and being able to give me an hour of your time today. It means everything to me because I, I feel like if we can – if we 128 people can start to move out into other people's lives and, and just be the best version of ourselves in their life, then everybody's mental health will improve. I think the rising tide lifts all the boats and um, I'm glad that you guys are part of that journey with me. So thank you very much. I really want to thank Mitch too for helping me out. Thank you, mate, for all, with all the tech and the questions. If you have any more questions, please keep them coming in. Let's keep this conversation happening. Have a great day today. We finished on time. I can't believe it. Um, I really hope you find your kindness today. Spend some of it on yourself. Put yourself first.